My name is Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. So glad you've chosen to worship with us today as we continue our sermon series that we're calling Courageous. Today we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2, looking at a most unlikely hero. If you'd like, go ahead and turn there, Joshua chapter 2. Ushers are coming down the aisle. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Uh, They'll be glad to give you one. If you don't presently own a Bible, please accept that as a gift from us to you. As you're turning uh, to Joshua chapter 2, let me give you a little bit of background, a little context for what's going on. The young Israelite nation has been delivered from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Moses has brought them out of their bondage But he's gone now. And Joshua has been appointed the new leader of the Israelite nation. He will be the one that will take them into the promised land. The land that God is preparing for them to occupy. Unfortunately, the land is already occupied by some of the most wicked, evil people you can possibly imagine. All sorts of tribes and small kingdoms who practice things like child sacrifice, constantly warring with each other. It was a brutal, vicious environment, but that's where they were going. And so the book of Joshua is primarily a book of conquest, of moving in and taking the promised land. We pick up reading in Joshua chapter two, verse one. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted And everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was a part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be upon his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied, let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and as they departed, she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. 
Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All of the people are melting in fear because of us. And then just one verse from chapter 6. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her. Because she hid the pen, Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Well, I suppose if you're not familiar with the story of Rahab, uh, it can come as a bit of a surprise. A prostitute? Taking center stage in the Bible? I mean, that doesn't exactly sound like biblical behavior does it? Perhaps you're even more surprised that in our sermon series, we're, we're, we're lifting her up as a, as a model of the virtue of courage. If you felt that way, I would certainly understand. But as mine and Pastor Ken's preaching professor, Dr. Callis, used to say, I marvel at the unflinching honesty of the Bible. The Bible presents its characters with no gloss, all of their failings and shortcomings and never makes any attempt to excuse them or explain them away. No, the Bible is a book of real people, real life. And that's exactly what we see in this person that's called Rahab. Real people, real life. And I like that about the Bible because it says to me that the Bible wants to speak into my life. It's not going to speak over my life. No, it's going to have something to say to me in the midst of all of my failures and shortcomings and pain as well. But even more marvelous than the fact that it's an honest book is the message of the Bible that that God can take all of the brokenness and messiness of our lives and somehow, some way, as only God can, bring unimaginable good out of it. That's certainly what he did with Rahab, as we're going to see. And by the time we're done, I hope we all understand and see together that that's what God wants to do with us as well. In all of our brokenness and messiness, God, as only God can, wants to bring something good and beautiful out of it. So who was this woman called Rahab anyway? Well, the Bible is pretty sparse in the details that it gives, but I think we can safely surmise a few things about her. And at the top of the list, certainly, would be the fact that uh, Rahab more than likely lived a hard life. I don't think life had been good to Rahab. In 2006, the National Institutes of Health did a comprehensive study of sex workers in the United States. And one of the findings they made was that upwards of 75% of women who are in the sex trade at some point in their childhood experience physical and or sexual abuse. Nobody just wakes up one day and decides, I think I'll be a prostitute. No, it's usually at the end of some pain and some suffering. Another thing I think we can surmise about Rahab is that even after she was grown, things didn't get much better. You see, in those days, women had no rights whatsoever. And the expectation was that they would be supported by a husband. Well, if you didn't have a husband, your options were pretty few. You could be reduced to begging or you could be reduced to selling yourself in order to make a living. And you know, this happened 3,500 years ago, but that kind of thing is still going on today. Governments still exist today that make no provision whatsoever for women who have no visible means of support. And when they do what they can, beg, prostitute themselves, 
That very same government looks upon them with contempt and scorn, but makes no effort to help them. A week ago today, uh, Seth Martin, uh, the road director, and I were in India, and we had the opportunity to meet a very special group of young women. In India, it is not uncommon that if you have reached a certain age and you have not married, your future is bleak. Just like in Jericho, you're more than likely going to be a beggar or a prostitute. But our partner in ministry there, Hope for Today, believes that uh, that's not what God wants for these women. And so they have rescued women from the streets and they have brought them in and they have developed a vocational school to teach them how to sew and other trades that they can use to make an honest living and support themselves. The dollars that you put in the plate week after week after week, that rescues those women. Those dollars go to our partner. You're making a difference all around the world through your generosity. Yeah, we live in a hard, hard world that's not always fair and not always good, especially to women I imagine Rahab had seen the worst of men. Brutal, crude, secretive. She knew the humiliating experience of of having men uh, privately pursue her passionately, but in public, pretending as though they'd never met her, don't know a thing about her. She lived in the shadows. Appropriately enough, she lived in the outer wall. Her home was actually built into the outside wall, which I think says a lot about her because she lived on the edge of life, the edge of society, the edge of hope, and the edge of love. Society didn't want to have to look at its ugly parts. They just as soon push it out to the edge. And there's one other thing I think we can know for sure about Rahab. She didn't want that life. Who would, in their right mind, who would want to live a life of abuse, humiliation, and rejection? Nobody asks for that, but sometimes that's where life leads, doesn't it? Maybe life didn't start out so good for you either. Maybe you too know the pain of being humiliated, abused, rejected. Or perhaps your life started out okay, but for a lot of reasons it hasn't turned out the way you thought it would. Things just haven't gone the way you had planned and dreamed and thought. And sometimes that can be every bit as painful as a difficult start. Perhaps you're like one of the countless individuals that I've seen in my counseling office over the years who know what it is to have a difficult start, to have things not turn out so well. And for some reason, the past, they're like a set of chains that just hold on to us and we just can't seem to get traction to move forward. The wounds are too deep. The scars are too prominent. We just can't get things going. Well, if that's been your experience, I want you to know there is hope. We're going to discover, just as Rahab discovered, that just because we start a certain way doesn't mean we have to finish a certain way. Our God is a bigger God than that. Some years ago, a a faith bridger came to see me. His name, uh, we'll call him Jim. And Jim knew a thing or two about pain and suffering. I mean, from the get-go, his life had not been fair. His biological father was an absentee drunk, who eventually left the family in dire 
poverty. And when his mother remarried, she traded in a drunk for an abuser who regularly beat her and the three siblings. And so it will come as no surprise that when he got old enough, Jim was out of there just as fast as he could get. And he swore to himself up and down, I will not live that life. My life will be different. And for a while it was. He uh, learned about himself early on that he had a knack for business, for making money. And other people noticed that about him too. And man, pop, 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 right on up the corporate ladder he moved. And by all outward appearance, Jimbo had the world by the tail. A lovely wife, great kids, fantastic job, piles of money. Anybody just looking in from the outside would think, what more could someone ask for? But on the inside, he was still that little boy who just wanted a dad to love him. But he never got that. And so he began to turn to substitutes, booze, and sex. And though it's not what he ever wanted, he became an addict. When he came to see me, he was on the edge, just like Rahab, out there on the edge and wondering, am I ever going to find a way back? But then God did something for Jim that he also did for Rahab. He sent some spies into his life. You know, you have to wonder, what are two good Jewish boys doing in a prostitute's house? Somehow that doesn't seem in keeping with a good Israelite upbringing. But bam, the scriptures say, you know, Joshua told them to go and they walked in the house of a prostitute. Well, remember, um, the charge that had been given to them was to spy out the land. What's going on? Let's be strategic here. Let's understand what's happening in this place and do it in such a way that you won't be seen so that you don't blow our cover. Well, for two young men, what better place? A place where there will be a number of men, particularly men who want to be invisible. But you know, I think if you read between the lines... Those spies went to her house for reasons that neither Joshua nor they themselves fully understood. No, I, th I think there was something much, much bigger going on behind the scenes. I think the spies went to Rahab's house because they were indicators to her that God was interested in her. You see, she already knew about God. She said to them, I, I, I know who you are. I know that you serve the God of heaven and of earth. She was very much aware of God's presence. But I have to think there were probably some times she wondered, but does he know about me? I, I've heard all about him, but does he care about me? I think those spies showed up not just to spy out the land, but unknowingly they were messages of God's love to her. Yes, I do know all about you, Rahab. I know who you are. I know you by name. And boy, when she saw the chance, she jumped on it. I mean, this woman took not, not just a step of faith, she took a leap of faith. That first overture of God toward her was all it took. And she is responding for all she's worth. I mean, think about it. She's lived in Jericho her whole life. That's all she's ever known. And suddenly, for no good reason, she's going to throw her lot in with these two guys who were spies and turn her back on all that she's ever known? No, I think she understood deep down inside. Yeah, God does know who I am. And God is reaching out 
to me here, and I am not going to miss the opportunity to respond. She took a huge risk. She took a leap of faith, and she turned her back on the customs of her home, the false gods, the evil, the wickedness, the brutality, everything that she had known. And when the living God reached a hand out to her, she took it and she said, I'm I'm choosing to believe in you. And that's why the writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews lists her in chapter 11. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, you're going to find a list of people that is commonly known as the Faith Hall of Fame. The writer begins to list men and women of the Bible who exhibited incredible faith. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, right there in the list. A woman of faith because she received the spies and ultimately was not disobedient. Jim had a spy come into his life too. It was his wife. And as you might imagine, she wasn't a happy spy. And she laid down the law. It's either the addictions or it's me. And he was so crushed. He was beside, I remember him saying to me, Dan, this this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And I said, no, 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 Jim, don't you understand? This is the best thing that has ever happened to you. The very best thing. Because God is reaching out to you through your wife and saying, I haven't given up on you. I love you. Oh, so much risk involved. He just back and I could see the struggle going on inside. I just don't know if I can come clean about, I mean, look at everything that is on the line, Dan. I mean, I could lose my job, my reputation. I could lose my whole family if I admit to what's going on here. I said, yeah, that's true. You possibly could. But do you really think God's love is going to come toward you to ruin you? And after some heavy-duty wrestling, he got down on his knees. He said, okay. Obviously, I I don't know what I'm doing, God. I've messed it up, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to choose you. I wonder if any spies are knocking on your door today. Is God sending his love to you somehow, some way, saying, hey, I, I do know who you are. And I, I, I do know the situation that you're in. And guess what? I love you. But here's the deal. God, God can send his love to us all day long, but he's not going to make us take it. That's called faith. That's what we have to do. We have to receive. We have to decide, yeah, that's what I want. And we have to make the decision to surrender what we can see for what we can't see. We have to decide to trust that God knows better than us, better than our wisdom, our experience, our understanding, our circumstances, We have to trust and be people of faith. Rahab didn't stop there, though. I mean, she not only exercised her faith, but she took action. Rahab understood, I think, probably better than most. Words are cheap. A dime a dozen. Action demonstrates the reality of faith. You want to know if somebody's faith is real? Watch how they behave. That's why she risked her life hiding the spies. And that's why she risked her life making a bargain with them. That's why she risked her life making sure they got out of the city safely and back. Yeah, she put action to her words. 
And that's why the New Testament writer of the book of James says of her in James 2.25, she was declared righteous for what she did. Not for what she said, but for what she did. You know, one of the great dangers we face living in the communication age is that we can assign so much unearned value to words. We give them, uh, you know, a position of preeminence that they don't always deserve. Words mean something when they are backed up with action. When Jim got up off his knees that day in my office, he, he knew, it, okay, it can't stop here. It's not just a matter of a simple prayer, Lord, please make it all better. No, he knew he had work to do. He knew that he had to get into rehab and begin the process of recovery. He knew that he had to repair broken relationships. He knew that he was going to have to learn how to deal differently with temptation. He was going to have to learn how to reinterpret his past so that he might be set free from the future. You know, there are some things that only God can do, but there are some things that only we can do. God's going to give us all of the grace and all of the strength and all of the love that we could possibly need, but he can't do it for us. Like Rahab, we have to exercise that faith and trust that he knows best. And then, as evidence of that, step in to action and do what God is calling us to do. It's been about 10 years since I made Jim's acquaintance. And I'm incredibly uh, happy to report to you that he's doing better than ever. Life is good for him. But he would be the first to tell you, man, it wasn't easy. It was the hardest thing that I have ever done. But I would do it again in a heartbeat. I have to think that in a room this size, there is someone here today to whom God is saying, hey, I know, I, I know who you are. I know your pain and I know your suffering and I have not forgotten you. I'm, I'm reaching out to you. And all you have to do is trust me. Trust me. Take a step toward me. Show me that you trust me. And let's see if we can't begin to shatter some of those chains. Let's see if we can't begin to heal some of those deep, deep wounds. Let's see if we cannot set you free. And even though you had a difficult, difficult start, I've got something so beautiful for you in the future. You can't even imagine. Rahab's life ends on a beautiful note. That, that last verse we read there in chapter 6, verse 25, tells us, you know, all, all of her life she had been an outsider living on the edge of society, shunned by everyone. And he, he, even after she was rescued by the Israelites, she wasn't immediately allowed to move into their camp. She was a foreigner. She was a prostitute. But God showed himself faithful. And in that verse, verse 25, what does the recorder say? What does the author say? And Rahab lives among the Israelites to this day. She went from being the ultimate outsider to being the ultimate insider. And not just because of where she got to live. There is an even yet more powerful and beautiful way, Scripture shows us, that Rahab moved from the edges of life right into the sweet middle of life. In Matthew chapter 1, there's a very interesting list. That gospel starts off listing the ancestors of Jesus. From Abraham right, right on down to the birth of Jesus. 
who were his fathers and great-grandfathers and so on and so forth. I want to read to you just a, a few verses. Matthew chapter 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. She went from being an outsider to being a part of the family, so to speak. And friends, I want you to know that's what God wants for you too. He doesn't want anyone to be left outside, but desires that everyone come in and find a place at the family table. And so just a moment, we're going to pray. And if you find yourself on that, that threshold, wh wh whether it's to enter into the family of God for the first time, or perhaps it's, it's to let God begin to address the hurt and the pain you've carried around far too long, th this is your opportunity to let God do what only God can do. Would you stand with me as we pray? <laughs> Father, how grateful we are that in the midst of the mess of our lives, you don't turn your back on us and you don't push us to the edge no, you move toward us just like you move toward Rahab. And so, Lord, we, we want to pray together as the body of Christ here that if there's anyone here this morning that is feeling like an outsider because they don't know you or because their hearts are so wounded, we pray together, oh God, today would be the day they step inside. Today would be the day they become a part of your family. If that's you, really all you have to do is pray like my friend Jim. Just say, Lord, I can't do this, but I believe that you can. And so I'm going to choose you. I'm going to surrender to you. If you prayed that, prayer today when the service is over I'm, I'm going to be in the, in the west atrium and I, I'm going to invite you to come and talk to me because I want to hear again how good God is Lord thank you for loving us we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus amen and amen amen